Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We have several visitors. We're glad you're here. May the good Lord bless you. I know it's a little rainy on the outside, but it's good to be on the inside of God's house to worship the Lord. You that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. And this is Preacher Edwards speaking. Now, if you get on that phone out there in the radio listen audience and call a friend, especially a shut-in, and have them to tune in, I do believe we can be an inspiration to them, be doing them a favor and us as well. We appreciate it so very much. Tape number 265, the message and the singing today and the music, of course, will be on this cassette tape. They're available for $3 each, and the gift is used to help defray our radio expense. I'd like you to write in and get these tape. We'll send you a list of our tape. We have 250 listed of our Sunday morning tapes, and you can request them by number or by title, and write in and get them. Now, I'll be speaking today on message number four in the book of Ruth. So you take your Bible and turn to Ruth chapter 2. It's page 316 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you be tuned to this station where you're now listening, at 12 o'clock noon each day, you can get the daily broadcast Monday through Saturday. We're making a study of the book of Acts on the daily broadcast, so I hope that you tune in Monday through Saturday and get the broadcast. Enjoy the singing and the message, and we appreciate it, and I want you to write to him and pray for me. I want to hear from you. If this broadcast is a blessing to you, let me hear from you. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is zip code number. So let me hear from you next week. We're living in troublesome times, a lot of problems, a lot of heartaches, a lot of trouble. I was reading the other day about this man out on a bridge, threatened to jump off and drown himself. And a policeman thought he'd go out and talk him out of it. And he went out to where he was standing. He said, Mr. said, you give me 10 minutes to prove to you that life is worth living. I'll give you 10 minutes to prove to me that life is not worth living. And so the policeman gave him 10 minutes. He gave the police 10 minutes, rather. And then the police in turn gave him 10 minutes. And they joined hands and both of them jumped off and drowned. So that's the situation you're in today. We need to realize that God can help us and will help us if we want to be helped. Now in the book of Ruth chapter 2, we had some wonderful thoughts out of chapter 1. And so in chapter 2, let me read a few verses. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her help was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the, set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray ye, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from this morning until now. And she tarred a little air. And then conclude my message on the tape, of course, under the audience here. And I want to say several things about some verses here in chapter 2. Now we saw on last Sunday how that Naomi came back to Bethlehem, Judah. And she came back in the days of barley harvest. Which speaks of a new beginning. Which speaks of revival. Which speaks of first love. Now we have a lot of God's children today that's living on half rations because they haven't gotten back to the time of barley harvest. 
God wants you to live in the time of barley harvest. Then comes, of course, the wheat and so forth, harvest that's the follower. But you need to get in on the beginning and stay in your first love in the time of barley harvest. And so now we come to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we meet another man. We meet man number 7. We saw uh, characters number 6. We saw Limelech, Naomi, Marlon, Kilion, Ophan, Ruth, six of them, which is the number of man. And then they come back to Bethlehem, Judah, that is Ruth and Naomi. And when Naomi came back and they said, is this Naomi? She is exactly in those days, prophetically speaking, where Israel is today. Israel today is watching for their people to come in. And when they come in, they say, are you our people? And they're coming back to the old Jewish homeland, just like Naomi went back in her day. Prophetically speaking, it's exactly the same thing that's happened then. It's happening now in this respect. And so when they came back, of course, Naomi said she went away full. God brought her back empty. And we dealt with the chastening phase of what happened there, how God chastened her, how she buried her entire family. And God cut her people down to one-fourth, like in Israel when they were scattered 70 AD from the land of Jerusalem or Israel. Now in chapter 2, they meet a new character, number 7. He's a type of Jesus. Number 7 is a type of completeness, of fullness. And they meet this man, verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. Now the name Boaz means strength. In him is strength, a man of strength. That's the meaning of the name Boaz. So they meet this character, and he's a wealthy man. Our Savior owns everything. The Bible tells us that. And not only that, he, this man owned a great field. And so is our God today in charge of a great field, the world. And he owns everything. Somebody said he owned the hills and the potatoes in the hills and the cattle on the hills. Well, Boaz was a mighty man of wealth. If you are saved today, you're joining of God, join of Jesus Christ, join of God and Jesus Christ, of course, and have access to all the greatness that He has access to in the future, and the spiritual blessings that come to us now on this earth. Now, Boaz here is a type of Jesus, a man of strength, a mighty man of wealth. He was a near kinsman. Uh, with, with right to redeem. Now the Bible tells in the Old Testament. If any of these people had to pawn or lease or leave their property. Because of a drought or because of failure. And they had to leave that. Then of course someone could redeem that back for them. Within the period of 50 years. Now on the 50 year period of time. Which is the time of Jubilee. They could get their property back. But if it was 30 years since they left it and 30 and uh, 20 years to go, then somebody could redeem those 20 years and get their property back for them. Now that's exactly what happened here. Elimelech and Naomi had some property there in Bethlehem, Judah, and they left that property when they should have gotten on their faces before God, turned their faces toward Jerusalem and prayed that God would send the blessings back to Bethlehem, Judah, Instead of doing that, they took off down to Moab, a cursed land, the Bible tells us, and left their property. Now they've come back. Naomi had spent some nine or ten years down there, which speaks of testimony and judgment. God deals with her in chastisement and judgment. She has a testimony when she comes back to give the people to tell them what God had done for her. So there's about 40 years left here that somebody must redeem back for them and of course to keep their name alive on the earth. All of those great Hebrew families hoped and prayed that the Messiah would come to their descendants and they wanted to keep their name alive in that land. Somebody had to buy that back. Somebody had to pay the price, restore the land back and restore their title back that they too might expect great things to happen through their descendants. And that is where this man Boaz comes in. The Bible said he was a near kinsman. The person that bought the property back had to be of near kin and had to be wealthy. Both of those things, of course, he had to have a near kinsmanship and plenty of money 
in order to purchase back land that had been pawned or left behind or uh, took over by the, the people there in Israel when the people left their land. Now this man was in line to do that as we see as we move along in the scriptures. He was a mighty man of wealth, a very wealthy man. Now you're going to see the grace of God when you find out who his parents were. We're not going to talk about that today. We'll do that at a later broadcast and tell you who his parents were. And you're going to be amazed at the grace of God, what happens here in the book of Ruth by the way of the grace of God. Now we find Ruth seeking grace, seeking rest, seeking peace, and all of these things she finds there in the land of Israel. And he's a mighty man of wealth, and he owned a great field. Now back in those days, they didn't put up fences like people do today in the, on their property. They would put up a hedgerow of stones. They'd put those stones around their field so people would know the land that belonged to them. The Bible speaks about not taking away the landmark. It was a serious thing to remove those stones. If someone came in and removed a man's stones he had there to mark his land, then that was a serious thing. He was in trouble. The Bible says, move not the old landmarks. Let them stay there. The same thing should be applied today. Don't remove the old landmarks. Stick with the old-fashioned Bible, the infallible Word of God, God's blessed book, a lamp on thy feet and a light on thy pathway. Nothing, nothing like it. Have nothing to do with these modern translations like the RSV and, and the New English Translation, Interpreter's Bible, Good News for Modern Man, the World Bible, and all that kind of junk that's, that's of course, um, translated by liberals, infidels, and modernists have nothing to do with those kind of books. Discard them if you have them, throw them away, and get your good old King James Version and stand on this book. You can take this book and stick the devil with it. You can take this book here and preach it, and sinners will be saved, and God will be blessed. I've never known anybody to be saved of preaching from an RSV, a New England translation, or the good news for modern man, or some of those modern translations. Never heard tell of anybody being saved of any modernistic preacher trying to preach from those modernistic translations. I have heard of a lot of people being saved when people preach from the old book of God. Don't remove the old landmark. Stick by this book. The good old King James Version. It was good enough for God to found this nation on. It was good enough for God to send revivals through. It was good enough to save your parents and grandparents. And it's good enough to save you so you stay with it. Don't let the devil trick you. Don't move the landmarks. And so he owned a great field. Number two. I want you to notice here that Ruth is a type of a new convert and a church wanting to work. Ruth, as she went back with Naomi, is a type of a new convert. Naomi is a type of Israel. Ruth is a type of a new convert and a type of the church. We'll see that as we move through the book of Ruth. And so we notice in verse 2, And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn. She was not a lazy person. I've never known God to bless a lazy individual. God always blesses when people are busy. When the apostles were busy out there fishing, God said, follow me. Now we find in the Bible when, the, of course, the Ruth here was gleaning in the field. She got the handfuls on purpose. You'll find when people are busy, when Elisha was plowing in the field, God said, follow me. God doesn't use lazy people. There's a man one time... Um, in a certain village is quite lazy and the committee in that village decided they'd see if they could find the laziest man in the village and and stick a sign on his back and let everybody know that he's number one in being lazy and they wanted around they locate this man up on top of a hill lying there flat his back in the sunshine and they said to him they said sir we're seeking for the laziest man in this village and when we find him we're going to put a sign on his back let everybody know who he is he said, I'm the man, said, turn me over and put the side on the back. And so we have a lot of people today that want to move the piano stool when the piano needs to be moved. We need some men today that's willing to work, willing to do things for God. And she wanted to go to the field and glean. She was not a lazy person. She said to Naomi, I want to work. I want to do something. And there's plenty to be done for God if we find people to do it. The trouble is, is finding people to do what God wants them to do. God will never use a lazy person. You must be smart and willing to do things for God, for God to use you. 
And so she said, I want to go glean in the field of corn. Corn is a type of bread, the bread of life, the blessings of God. I want to go and uh, glean in the field, she said to Naomi. Then what happened? We find now for 1900 years, the church has been working in the field. It is now in the gleaning stage. It started out in the early days after the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the church began to spread out and spread the gospel. And you find in Revelation chapter 2 that Jesus walked in that early church in the midst of the candlesticks. In the early phase of the church age, there he was. People were working. That was the beginning of the church age. And then later on, at the latter part of chapter 3 in the Laodicean state of the church age, where do you find the Son of God? You find him on the outside knocking. He said, if any man, if any man open the door and come in, I'll sit with him and he with me. We're now in the leaning stage. Would to God we could have some great revivals. I wish I could get into a great revival one time before I die. But we're living in the days which is typical of the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, only eight people got into the ark. I'm afraid we're not going to have a worldwide revival, nor a nationwide revival. We can have an individual revival, a church revival, a community revival, if we're willing to pay the price. Would to God we could have a great revival. Wouldn't it be wonderful? It most certainly would. Back, John, many years ago on Sunday nights were your greatest crowds. That's when they gathered in the house of God on Sunday night. And, but now you find many people sitting at home looking at TV on Sunday night. Only a few standing by God's work and by God's man and, and in God's church willing to do the work of God. The rest of the people love the world and love the TV set and love pleasure more than they love God. And you can't get them out Sunday night or Wednesday night. That's a shame. We're living in the days of the gleaning. Reaching one now and then. I've never seen the time like in the past two or three years of my ministry. Where it's so hard to get people saved. You have to reach one here and reach one there. There was a time when every Lord's Day people woke down the aisles. Got right with God. But you can't get sinners saved till you get them into the house of God. Or get them to hear the word of God. they got to be there. If they're not here, they can't walk out and get saved. Now why aren't they here? Well, we as God's people not getting them here. That's why if we got them here, got them on the influence of the gospel, they hear the gospel, they get saved. And they can't get saved unless they're here. That is from our services. We need to realize that we're living in the days of the gleaning. We're living in the gleaning period. Now, Ruth had rather glean in the land of Israel than to be a great lady in Moab. She might have been, of course, an outstanding lady down in Moab. Uh, she could have maybe uh, won the um, a contest and been the most beautiful person down there. She could have had a great position in Moab. But she had rather glean in the field of God than to be an outstanding lady in the land of Moab, in a cursed land among those heathen down there and worshiping a false god. So she's gleaning in the field. And the reason so many people they are living on half rations is because they're not willing to go to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest and begin to clean for God. Now she counseled with one older than she and had, that had experience in verse 2. She said to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Naomi had had experience. Naomi had been through some tough times and she had suffered and she knew God and she'd been in Israel when God blessed Israel. And she'd been in Moab in the land where God had cursed and she had suffered and she had buried her three, uh, three of her loved ones there in a cursed land and left them there. And she's, she, had, she was a, an old weather-beaten troop, so to speak. She knew that she'd been through the battles and Ruth knew that. And Ruth goes to her and says, Naomi, I want to talk to you. I want to go to the field and glean in the field. I want to work. I want to do something. And she went to the right person. Now the Bible says you older women, you ought to instruct and talk to the younger women. You older men, you ought to help the younger men. You younger men ought to consult the older men and older Christians about things to do and what to do. And they can help you because they have been there. They have weathered the storm. They know what to do and they know how to help you. And they will. Now she knew that she was wise. She went to Naomi and said, I want to go. And glean. Now notice that Ruth had a great ambition to glean. Notice verse 2. She said, let me go. Let me go for God. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go and glean. 
And then she says in verse 7, let me glean, glean in his word, glean in his field. God wants you to glean in his word. God wants you to dig in the blessed book. God wants you to search out the scriptures. God wants you to glean. And then she said, let me find, she says, find favor here. Let me find favor with God. Let me find a place to labor. Every child of God should want to find favor with God. You should be in good favor with God. If you're not, you can find favor with God. And she said, let me find. Now divine providence conducted her to the field of Boaz. The Bible tells us that she happened, it has so happened that she landed in the field of Boaz. There's other great fields around there. There were other landowners around there. But divine hand of God led Ruth the field of Boaz. I'm glad we have a God that guides us and leads us. And so he led her to that place. It was her help. Her help to land in that field. It was God's divine hand that placed her in that field. We need to consider the hand of God or where God wants us. And be willing to serve the Lord where he places us. And he placed her there. He led her to exactly the right spot. I contend, I contend if we will abide according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we can know the will of God and we can end up exactly where God wants us. God doesn't want us to be confused about our place of service. God wants us to be in his will. God has a place for us and God will place you in the field where he wants you to labor if you're willing to abide according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I believe that. And she was willing. And she wanted to labor in the field. And she was laboring down in the field. Down there picking up grain that had fallen out of the cradle. Where they were cutting the grain or whatever they used to cut that grain. And they would uh, stack it and put it in shocks and sheaves and stack it up. And then the grain that would fall on the ground. That's what she was picking up. And then the little grain around the edges. God said in the Old Testament, He said, now leave a little grain around the edge of the field for the widows and the poor. Don't just clean the field completely up. Leave some grain for them. And she was down there real busy. She was picking up the scattered grain on the ground. The reapers coming along and as they had cut the grain and some had fallen out. She was busy, real busy, picking up what she could to get a little grain to carry back for food there in the home of Naomi while she was staying. And she was real busy. Now get this. While she was real busy, God gave her some handfuls on purpose. When Boaz came on the scene, he said to her, he said to the reapers, I want you to let some fall out on purpose. Isn't that wonderful? I want you to drop a little handful here and leave a little special over here. And drop a few here. And just leave it there. And when she comes along she'll pick it up. Give her some handfuls on purpose. Now you listen to me today. I want you to get this. If you're faithful. And you want to go. And you want to serve. And you want to be in the right place. And you want to serve God. Then if you'll get busy for God. I'll guarantee you on the authority of God's word that God's going to dump you out some handfuls on purpose along the way. He surely will. I don't know how he may do it, but he'll do it one way or the other. He surely will. You'll get those handfuls on purpose. Every once in a while, God dusts me off a little handful on purpose. I praise God and thank God for it. And he has you. Can you look back and see where a little extra blessing has come in? Where you got a little raise in your salary? Well, a little something uh, did better than you thought it would have done. And, and things turned out a little better than you thought they would have turned out. But see, God wants to give you a handful on purpose. Have you ever gone to the doctor and everybody thought she's going to die right away. And, and you just sure to die in the next few days. And you go to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you're all right. And, and give you a little uh, prescription and, and you were all right. God giving you handfuls on purpose. He knows how to do that. He surely does. And God will give you handfuls on purpose, but you must be gleaning in the field. You must be in the right place. You must be willing to take advice from the elders. You must be willing to go and work in God's field. Now, she was in Boaz's field. She wasn't in a field of some other Israelite. She's in Boaz's field. 
Boaz is a type of Jesus. Now, as a child of God, you must labor in the field of the Lord, in the Jesus field, if you want the blessings of God. And that's exactly what she did. Now, notice number three. Notice the term Ruth the Moabitess is found five times in the book of Ruth. Now, let that sink in because that's quite significant. The name, the term Ruth the Moabitess is found five times in the book of Ruth. Now, five is the number of grace. It's found in chapter 1 and verse 22. It's found in chapter 2 and verse 2. It's found in chapter 2 and verse 21. It's found in chapter 4 and verse 5. It's found in chapter 4 and verse 10. Ruth the Moabitess. Now, five is the number of grace. And it's the grace of God that brought this woman, which is a type of a sinner being saved, and also a type that said, it's the grace of God that placed her here while she was gleaning in this field. It's by the grace of God that you're saved and you're kept by the power of God. She has seen you testifying with our daughters of worship of Moab. Uh, they were forbidden to come into the congregation of the Lord on the tenth generation. Thus she was a stranger to the covenant of promise. Now, this woman here should not have been brought in to the congregation of the Lord. That is the more about his people should not have unto the tenth generation. But now she comes in by the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, been agents from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That's a picture of the Gentiles today. We're away from the covenant of God except through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells you that in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. So it's by the grace of God that she's brought here and mentioned five times in the book of Ruth called Ruth the Moabitess. Five the number of grace. When Israel marched out of Egypt, they marched in ranks of five, showing they were coming out by grace. Elijah's servant saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand, five fingers on the hand, which is grace. When Elijah said, go to the top of Mount Carmel, take a peep across the middle range and see if you see any rain coming. His servant went seven times, which is the number of completeness. And then he came back after the seventh trip. He said, I see, sir, a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, that's God's hand, brother. That's five fingers counting a thumb on your hand, which is a number of grace. He said, you see the grace of God. That's a little cloud coming. That's a hand of God. And you better get moving. That's coming a gully washer. Tell old King Ahab, you don't want to drown. You better get going. And there came a flood, a gully washer. Had rained three and a half years. But by the grace of God, a little cloud the size of a man's hand came the gully washer. The marvelous, powerful grace of God. Then we find um, that David took five stones to the brook to take care of Goliath. He didn't need but one. Put four in his pouch, one in his slingshot. And five is the number of grace. He said, by the grace of God, brother, I'm going to turn your heels up. And by the grace of God, he took one stone, hit the man between the eyes, knocked him as cold as a possum's nose, and went and took his own sword and cut the man's head off and killed him, put him to death with his own sword. And he didn't need the other four. He had grace, all right, but he didn't need but one stone to do the job. You say, preacher, why did he get five stones? Well, the old Goliath had four brothers peeping over the hill over there. And in case they got too big for their britches, he'd take care of them too. But by the grace of God, Goliath went down and God gave the victory. Jesus fed the, the people with five loaves and the fishes. There was a great multitude and Jesus took five loaves, the number of grace, and there he fed that great multitude. He just kept on feeding, kept on breaking the bread, kept on, kept on till he fed the multitude. Told the disciples, take up 12 baskets, take a basket each, and you have a little eat down the road, and let's move on. That's the grace of God. It's a marvelous grace of God that can do the job. Ruth the Moabitess is mentioned five times in the book of Ruth. She's there because of the grace of God. And you are here today because of the grace of God. By grace you say through faith that none of you says it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank God for his wonderful, marvelous grace. Amen. Hallelujah. You listen well. Let's stand our feet. Father, I pray that you'll take the message today and use it. May your name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. 
We thank you, dear God, for those that came this way today. We pray that you'll bless them and those listening in the radio listening audience. We pray, dear God, that you'll use the message to help them and reach some lost soul today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, Debbie's playing for us some number on the organ. And while she plays a couple of stanzas, listen to me closely. I brought you the message God's laid on my heart. I brought you the message number uh, four from the book of Ruth. Message number 255 on my list. Now listen, if God has spoken to your heart, you need to get saved. Come down here and let us help you to God. If you're here and you want to know the Lord, you need to get back to Bethlehem. You need to come back to the beginning of barley harvest. Where you can get the wheat and, and the rye and so forth. You need to come. Where you can get the barley. Come back to a new beginning like Naomi did. Back in a new start. You might lead somebody back with you. If you come back to God. Like she did Ruth. Would you come, if you're here. And you feel that God wants you to be a member of this church. And the way we receive members. You'll come forward and present yourself. We'll take that in consideration. But you obey God. Whatever God tells you to do. You ought to do it. While she plays. Will you come? Let's go. God is speaking. Would you obey him? That's all we ask you to do. Thank you. 